uh, I, I don't, uh, uh, I do insolvency work. Uh, I do uh, as little as possible because it means someone's going insolvent, which is never a good thing, but uh, it's usually when they get into trouble that they come see me in the first place. Uh, I've worked with Angela. Angela Pollard is my co-presenter and she is a licensed uh, insolvency trustee. I've worked with her in the past on a number of files and, and she is uh, very knowledgeable and a great source of information and uh, we'll have a lot of interesting information for you uh, today on uh, what to do if your small business is going to, uh, is at the point where you might be considering bankruptcy. Uh, the rationale behind this uh, webinar being part of the series of webinars that Tyler Campbell did in May was that unfortunately it seems that a lot of businesses are running into financial trouble uh, as part of or as a result of COVID and um, some of them are uh, some of them are um, solely because of COVID, but a great many more situations where the economic impact of COVID is the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back and the businesses were already in a troubling situation beforehand, but just struggling through. Um, in either case, people are starting to think about, do I have to make my business go bankrupt? And if so, uh, what does that mean for me? Um, and that's the sort of thing we hope to discuss briefly here today. If I can uh, just interrupt, I'm Angela Pollard. Um, I will talk a little bit about insolvency, but keep in mind that it'll be very high level. It won't be detailed. And I have enjoyed many years working with Michael. He's a great lawyer. And uh, please keep that in mind if you need uh, good legal assistance. Thanks, and, Michael. And I noticed we got our first question about whether we can get the PowerPoint or notes from the presentation. Um, on this next slide, you'll see that this is the fourth in a series of uh, presentations Eiler Campbell did uh, throughout the month of May. And um, videos of all of them, this one will be, but the other three already are available on EilerCampbell.com. If you go to our website, and click on the education uh, tab, um, you should find links to each of these. Uh, that's not quite the answer, so I will uh, defer to Fraser. Fraser, is there a way that we can send these PowerPoints to people if they email and uh, request them? We can certainly do that. You can send and reply to uh, any of the emails you've received about the presentation, and I'll send you the PowerPoint. Okay. And there's another question. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, throughout the course of this, uh, we may not answer each question as it arises. We'll play it by ear and see if it's something that would wait to the end or something that is, is uh, timely in light of what we're talking about at the time. Um, and hopefully that works out. It's kind of hard, Angela and I have both uh, discussed, it's kind of hard doing a webinar because we don't get feedback from the attendees uh, the way we would in a live con uh, live presentation. So we're going to do our best and, and hopefully things work out for everybody. Um, to Angela's point, oh, a brief overview of what we're going to do. And, and again, as Angela pointed out, it's, it's very high level. Uh, we're going to discuss what your business structure is. That's going to be relevant to your personal liability. Um, whether you have any contractual liability that would attach to you as opposed to your business. Um, where the business is a corporation, it's going to have directors and directors have certain obligations, uh, including that they are liable for some uh, corporate obligations uh, in the event of insolvency. We're going to discuss something that's called transactions at undervalue in the insolvency world and uh, a whole bucket of other things in the general litigation world, which I've mushed together under the phrase reviewable transactions. And then we'll discuss other, way, other ways that you might be personally liable for the debts of the business. And to Angela's point that this is a very high level uh, sort of presentation, um, 
I've got a standard disclaimer when I do presentations, which is that we're giving legal information uh, to the uh, attendees and not legal advice. Uh, the difference being, you know, two of my favorite phrases or sayings are God's in the details and the devil's in the details. Because uh, at the end of the day, no matter which way you look, good or bad, the details matter. And we don't have the time uh, in a presentation that's this short to make the deep dive into anybody's situation. And there may be a lot of things we discussed today that are completely irrelevant to some of you, but terribly relevant to others of you. Uh, it's just that each situation has its own facts, each situation has its own considerations. And what I strive to do in a situation like this is to give you the ability to kind of know the lay of the land so that you know when there is an issue and you need to consult someone like Angela or myself. Uh, for more personalized advice. Um, might be splitting hairs, the distinction, but it's, a, it's an important one. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we manage to stay on the right side of it. So with that said, on to the first uh, point, which is the different types of business organizations. Now, if you have a business, uh, it can be in a number of different forms. Um, and, and the four main ones are corporations, partnerships, joint ventures, and sole proprietorships. And a lot of small business owners will talk about my company. And that could be any one of those things. Uh, uh, you know, someone with a lemonade stand on the corner, that's their company. And it may be that they own it and, and they operate it and it's really just a facet of them. On the other hand, um, they may own and operate it with their neighbor. And in that case, they may be partners. Again, the partnership is just another facet of the partners. Um, except that when compared to a situation where you own the company all by yourself uh, versus where you're a partner with someone, there are rules and obligations that each of you owe to the other, which can vary depending on your arrangement. And then there are corporations, and, and those are what people often think of when they think of companies. Um, certainly most large businesses are incorporated. Uh, those aren't um, extensions of the owner. Uh, they are actually, corporations are actually separate legal persons. And you're going to see something like, uh, you know, um, ABC Incorporated or ABC Corp or ABC Limited or LPD for short for limited. A corporation has to have one of those phrases, incorporated, incorp, corporation, corp, or limited as part of its name. And that's a signal to the rest of the world that this is a separate legal person. And the owners of the corporation actually own shares in the corporation. They don't own the company directly. They uh, own a bundle of rights that attach to the shares. Um, so, for example, a partnership uh, doesn't own property. Instead, the partners each own a share of the actual property. So if there is a, a if Angela and I were partners, for example, in a business and we had a business bank account, we would each own directly a share of the money in the account. Whereas with a corporation, it's going to own its own account. And uh, the shareholders may own a right to part of the assets of the corporation when it winds up, but they don't directly own it. It's not their money. Um, and the same is true of liabilities and taxes. Those belong to the company, not the owner. 
And this is why a lot of people will incorporate. Because if you have a legitimate corporation and you run it properly and you avoid all of the situations and subject to a very few exceptions like director's liability, if the business becomes insolvent, you personally may not be liable for those debts. Uh, whereas if you were a partner in a partnership and that business went insolvent, you would share part of the liability personally. Having said that, even if you do incorporate, you may be liable for some of the debts of the business, which is what we're looking to explore in the remainder of the discussion. And I've gone over uh, something that took pretty much a full course, a full semester course in law school to, to discuss in about five minutes. So I think this would be a good point to ask if there are any questions about that idea, because I think it's crucial to a lot of the rest of what we talk about today. Um, I don't see any questions, so hopefully that's good. The, the takeaway is that um, if you're incorporated and you run it properly, you can avoid a great deal of personal liability if the company, if the business runs into financial trouble. But if you are running it in a manner that's not incorporated, uh, you are open to more personal liability. So some of the ways that you can become personally liable if, uh, if you're incorporated and the business goes bankrupt or becomes insolvent uh, is that you might have contractual liability. For example, you might be liable for a pre-incorporation contract. You might be liable under a guarantee or you might be liable if you've drafted a contract and it's not clear that you are uh, entering the contract as a corporate entity. And with respect to pre-incorporation contracts, those are, as the name suggests, co contracts entered before the corporation is formed. And because there's no corporate person yet, the corporation hasn't been born essentially, uh, they're entered into by one or more human people, the, the people who are behind the, the shareholders, for example, or directors. Now, because they've entered the contract, they are the actual parties to the contract and in the end may be uh, responsible for the obligations under the contract. The Business Corporations Act uh, provides that where there's a pre-incorporation contract, the party that enters it the human person is personally liable until the corporation takes over, uh, takes the contract over. For example, if it's a contract, if it's a lease for space, once the uh, corporation starts paying the rent and takes over the space, the liability transfers to the corporation and the person is no longer responsible unless the, the contract says differently. A lot of contracts like leases and franchise agreements uh, will say that um, Mr. Johnson is buying a franchise for Joe's Donuts and uh, he's going to incorporate and the, the, the uh, franchise agreement will be assigned to the corporation once that's done. But the contract may say Mr. Johnson will still be responsible for all of the obligations under the contract. So it may be that even though you have contemplated transferring it to a corporation once you form it, you are still personally liable at the end of the day. That example isn't exactly a guarantee, but it's, it's a form of a guarantee because it's a situation where you are continuing to be responsible for somebody else's obligations. A uh, more traditional guarantee is a situation where you're not a party to the contract at all. You've already got your corporation up and running, say, and you go to lease space and the landlord says, well, that's all well and good, but your company doesn't have any sort of a business record or track record. So I want you, Mr. Johnson, to personally, and by the way, if there is actually Mr. Johnson in the crowd today, I don't mean to single you out. It's just a name I chose randomly, but, um, you, Mr. Johnson, I want you to guarantee 
that if your corporation does not pay the rent, that you will do so. That if your corporation goes bankrupt, you will continue to be responsible. Um, guarantees occur often in the situation of, again, franchise agreements, where there is already a corporation in place, or uh, mortgages that tend to have a lot of uh, guarantor provisions, loans from banks. Um, it's very similar uh, to what uh, a layperson might think of as a co-signer. And it's not uncommon with small businesses. Now, some guarantees you can get out of at the end of the day by uh, saying, I no longer want to guarantee this business. And from that point forward, you're not responsible for any new liabilities. Uh, others don't permit you to do that without the permission of the, uh, the uh, other side to the contract. And again, it's all, what does the contract say? But just because you had the foresight to incorporate your company before entering any of these agreements doesn't mean you won't have a separate liability as a guarantor. And lastly, uh, with respect to contractual liability, there's the issue of where it's not clear that a contract is with a corporation. Um, because the corporate uh, uh, business structure lets you avoid personal liability, uh, it's, it's very important, and this will become an issue as we get toward the end of it when we talk about the oppression remedy, but um, it, it's very important that you be upfront about the fact that you're contracting as a corporation so that um, people who enter agreements with you are aware that if something goes wrong in the contract, they can't get at your personal assets, but they are limited to what the company has. So that if you had a home renovation business, for example, and uh, you know, you just called it Johnson's Renovations, and the real name was Johnson's Renovations Limited, and you signed at Johnson's Renovations per Mr. Johnson, and you uh, uh, didn't say president of a corporation, you didn't say corp, you didn't use the full name, you might be personally liable. Uh, the idea is if you're gonna take advantage of the protection of a corporation, then you need to be upfront with people that you're contracting with so they can weigh uh, the pros and cons of entering a contract with you without protections like, for example, a guarantee. So, the takeaway from this slide is if you are entering a contract on behalf of your corporation, it needs to be clear you need to use the proper corporate name. If you've got a business name, like, uh, you know, uh, if, you're, if your company is actually a numbered company, one, two, three, four, five corporation, which is not uncommon, uh, and you've got Johnson's Renovations as a trade name, you need to have your contract say Johnson's Renovation, or uh, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, corporation doing business as Johnson's Renovations, or somehow signal that it's a corporation that's the party to the contract. Um, having said that, we're going to move on to directors, uh, actually to options under the BIA, and I'm going to let Angela take over for a while. Hello, everyone. I'm happy you could join us. Um, really, what I want to talk about is what happens when you find your company. Uh, in financial difficulty and how can you proceed moving forward? There's really two options available for a small business and I'm only going to talk about small businesses because larger businesses do have other options. So for a small business, you have the option of filing a proposal or filing a bankruptcy and those are what's available to you. And let's say you want to look at one of those options and we're going to first look at the option of filing a proposal. A proposal is the best of the two options for the directors of a company. And as I move forward, you'll begin to see that that is a better option if you're able to do so. A proposal allows the management to continue to operate. The management is involved with the licensed trustee to restructure the company company itself. It allow, allows for significant flexibility. So as an example, as Michael had been talking about franchise agreements, leases, things of those nature, 
in a proposal, you have the ability to unload certain assets and certain obligations that actually affect your company and make it no longer profitable. So as an example, let's say you have a um, business that you have two lines, um, a massage therapy business as an example, and you have two operations, two different locations, one here in Calgary, one in Nova Scotia, and your Nova Scotia portion is not doing well, and but your Calgary business is booming. Well, a proposal will allow you to get rid of the Nova Scotia division. It allow you to move forward with the restriction. It allows you to get rid of leases that aren't profitable, or it allows you to get rid of a landlord that the rent is just too high for your operation. It allows you to compromise all of your debts. And for directors, one of those debts that allows you to compromise is income tax owed by the corporation and HST owed by the corporation. Most people feel that the government debts can't be compromised, but they actually can in a proposal. It allows the company to continue to operate. It does so much benefit for your company if you want to look at a proposal before just jumping into a bankruptcy. And one of the important things to note is sometimes the company just needs a break. It needs a moment to reflect before it moves forward um, to figure out what it wants to do or how it wants to do it. And under a proposal, we have come something called a notice of intention to file a proposal. And what that does is it gives you this 30 day window to just wait and try to figure out what kind of proposal I want to file, how I want to restructure it, and can I restructure it. There's a few things that you have to do during that period of time, but it does give you that option to try and step back think about what you want to do. How do I want to move forward? Can I move forward? And another important thing, whether it's a bankruptcy or a proposal, there's an automatic stay of proceedings. So that means all those legal actions that might be coming against you are stayed. People have the right to go to court to try and get the stays lifted, but they're automatically stayed. You don't have to worry about them during this period of time. If we can go to the next slide, Michael, thanks. So some of the things that are terms that we need to look at in a proposal, one of them is that cash flows. A cash flow has to be filed within 10 days. 10 days of filing a notice of intention to file a proposal, 10 days within a proposal. And that cash flow has to show that the company can continue to make its payments moving forward. So it's suppliers that has to be pay, able to pay, it's new suppliers, it's employees, all of those things. So this cash flow is very important. And the trustee will assist you in preparing the cash flow if you have difficulty. A couple of other really important things with a proposal, and sometimes this is the make it or break it for filing a proposal. Within six months of filing a proposal, the company has to pay in full the payroll liability that is owing to Revenue Canada. That includes employer CPP, employee CPP, EI, and interest and penalty. So it's really important that when you're looking at a proposal, you know what your government debt is for payroll deductions. Remember, it's not HST, it's not income tax, it's payroll deductions, and it has to be paid within six months of court approval. No one can, we don't have any authority or any right to extend that. It is a mandatory aspect of a proposal. The other thing with a proposal that's important is that your creditors have to accept it. And it's your number of creditors need to accept it and as well as the dollars. So 50% of the creditors have to accept it and two thirds in dollar value. Generally, in order to file a proposal, you need the support of your financial lender. You need them to be on, on side, knowing that you're going to file a proposal to give you a line of credit, to allow you to continue to operate, maybe help you refinance the company going forward. Something else to really keep in mind is that all of your trade suppliers will probably put you on COD. Sometimes you might have a good working relationship with some of them and they won't do that, but they can. And it's, it's important that you just take a de deep breath and try to figure out, can I do a proposal?
proposal? How can I move forward? What do I need to continue to operate? How much is my rent? How much is my leases? You prepare like a budget and you move forward with that. So it's really important to continue on, but it's important to have the funds available. And really important thing, the most important thing for the directors in a proposal is that we compromise your director's liability. Meaning that if the proposal is accepted by your creditors and accepted by the courts, and you have a clause such as what I've put in this slide here, it's the standard clause that I use. Oh, other trustees might use a different clause. This is one I use. HST, as an example, which is a director's liability, they will get a compromise, meaning they won't be paid in full in the proposal. But with this clause in place, if you fulfill the terms of the proposal, they cannot pursue you personally. It allows for all of your director's liabilities to kind of be wiped out at the end of the day, assuming this clause is in your proposal and assuming that your creditors in the court accept the proposal. So if we can move forward from that, and before I go there, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, I see none. So the next thing is we look at a bankruptcy. And a bankruptcy really is when you cannot continue to operate. You have no ability to continue to operate. There's a lot of reasons for it. And I've given some examples of the reasons, but I think before COVID, the main reason was that you no longer had the same market share or one of your main customers filed for bankruptcy and, or somebody pursued you legally. Those were generally the main reasons. The first one that I have there, your financial institution no longer just prepared to support you. That does happen, but that normally happens as if you're out of covenants or if you're in an industry that the bank has now decided it no longer wishes to support. Sometimes the owner of the company is not well or has decided they want to move forward and do something else. But with the pandemic that's here, a lot of companies won't be able to continue to operate in the fashion that they previously operated. An example is a gym children's gyms. When do we, are we going to find that we can have children playing around less than six feet apart? How are we going to deal with these things? And these companies, unfortunately, even with all of the government assistance that's in here, will find that they no longer can operate and they can find themselves in a bankruptcy situation. So if we talk about bankruptcy, there are issues with that bankruptcy and they really are the director's liability for the small owners. Michael had talked about how important it is to incorporate the companies, incorporate a company to sign all of these agreements, knowing that, you're, that it's a company that's getting on the debt. But unfortunately, Revenue Canada has director's liabilities, meaning anything that you owe as a company for HST and payroll liability is your personal liability. You have a defenses and there are certain defenses that are out there, but if you come across this, one of the things you need to do is speak to a lawyer um, about uh, what kind of defense you might have, but the government has the right to come after you for HST and payroll liability. The other problem that you have is employees employees wages and vacation pay are director's liability and normally for a small business when they find themselves in financial difficulty a lot of the debts that they find that they have are debts to their employees are debts to the government small business operators they want to make sure they continue to get their supplies so if they have to not pay something they'll won't pay you their hst or their payroll deductions they kind of use it as a banking a lending tool so it's important to look at that. That is your personal liability. And I've put down here environmental claims because I think people forget about the environment. And sometimes you might be uh, have a, as part of your corporate assets, a piece of land. And on that land, you don't know what's happened in the past. And there could be some environmental problems. And unfortunately, 
even though you bought the land, you didn't create the environmental problem, the government can pursue you personally for environmental liability. So it's important to look at that area too. Director's guarantees, Michael touched on it partially, but the director has certain obligations in reference to the guarantees that it's signed. Sometimes you don't actually really realize you've signed them. So as an example, you get a credit card for your business and you buy it, get that credit card and they say, oh, sign here for the credit card. Well, in a lot of cases, you're signing personally. In that line, it'll say that if the company goes bankrupt or you don't make the credit card payment, they're gonna pursue you personally, the bank. Credit processing companies like Moneris, they have you signed personally. You don't really realize that you've done so. They don't really explain to you. And especially as a small business owner, you go in, you, you need all of these things set up. You go ahead, you sign the documents. You haven't talked to your lawyer. You haven't had your lawyer look at it because you need a credit card. You need to process your bills. So those end up being personal liabilities. Franchise agreements, Michael talked about that. A lot of cases, most cases, somewhere deep down in that document, you're signing personally for the franchise. Landlord's the same, the lease. Somewhere in there, there's something about guaranteeing the lease and you could personally be signing those. Bank loans, leases with equipment companies are normally very straightforward. They tell you very clearly and outline you're gonna be personally guaranteeing this if you want it. So it's important to know that. A lot of companies we're seeing now having difficulty are in the construction industry. Those companies, it's important to remember that you might have a breach of trust. If you have a company that's in construction and you're, as Michael was talking, Johnson Limited, and you're building doors and you don't realize, you know, every job you go to, you ha don't have a different bank account and you're moving the money around to pay all of your trades, you could find yourself in a breach of trust. It's really important to look at what you're doing to talk to professionals to make sure that you know exactly what your director's liabilities are and your director's guarantees. Another thing in a bankruptcy that people don't realize, accountants uh, don't really look at it because they're trying to save you money for your personal income tax and don't look at the fact or you don't know that your company might not be able to make its payments. If you get dividends in the year that you file an assignment of bankruptcy, those dividends have to personally be repaid back to the company. Sometimes, you know, accountants yourself, you don't wanna pay that massive payroll liability debt. But if that company finds itself in insolvency, in a bankruptcy, you will have to repay back that dividends. And that's why I was saying, it's really important to look at a proposal before just jumping in to filing a bankruptcy because the dividend issue is not really an issue in a proposal. So here comes the one that's gonna scare you the most really. The government has a section in the Income Tax Act under section 160. And that section is a scary section. It's been around forever, but Revenue Canada didn't in the past really use that section of the act. And what it really says is that you're an owner of the business. You've gone ahead, you've set up everything that your spouse owns the home. Your spouse stays at home, owns the home. However, doesn't have any um, uh, income coming in the door and, and you've been supporting your family. The problem has that if there's anything owed to the government, income tax, HST, any of those things, payroll, and you as a director, you don't have anything. So you're going to look at how am I going to deal with it? How's the government going to get anything? I don't have any assets. I have no income. There's nothing for me to get. The government arm can go and start looking at your spouse and who paid for that house that you had. And they can go ahead and ask for all of the government debts from your spouse. Worse than that, you'll see that I have a little example here. The government is now looking at children, children that went to private school. What did you spend for your child's university? 
they can then attack the child, saying the child benefited because you didn't pay the government debts in that corporation. And you took money out as wages or dividends or however you did that. And they're going to say, instead of taking your wages and your dividends, you should have been paying the government. And therefore, we are pursuing your children, your wife, your husband, any party that is was not operating at arm's length with you. It's really important that you seek legal advice if you ever get that claim or your spouse or your children have the claim come against you with the government. Please keep in mind, this is a very high level and it's a complicated issue. So I want to make sure that you just realize this is just a couple of topics and this is a very complicated topic, section 160 of the Income Tax Act. So just to piggyback on what Angelo said about uh, director's liability for wages, um, that's imposed by the uh, there's a Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, I believe, but it's also imposed by some other uh, acts that are not uh, federal, they're Ontario acts. Uh, and uh, the two that are most typically looked to in that regard are the Employment Standards Act and the Business Corporations Act. And uh, you'll see that the, the general rule is the same. The Business Corporations Act is a bit broader uh, because it would also encompass expenses incurred by an employee that aren't wages. Um, the, the point of raising these is that uh, sometimes a uh, business owner will just, they won't go bankrupt and they won't seek a proposal. They'll just lock the doors and put up a gone fishing sign and uh, just stop operating. And uh, even without invoking the, the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, directors are still liable if there are unpaid wages for work done uh, up to the point that the business stops operating. Um, termination pay is, is not covered by this. Directors aren't typically liable uh, under these statutes for uh, termination pay because you didn't give someone enough notice that their job was coming to an end. But if there are unpaid wages or unpaid vacation pay or expense accounts that are uh, outstanding, you can find that you're liable for uh, an amount equal to up to six months worth of wages and uh, 12 months worth of vacation pay. It's not 12 months worth of pay, but the amount of vacation they would have accrued over a 12 month period. Um, just to piggyback on what Michael just said, it's, it's also Im important to remember that even though I've mentioned what the director's liabilities are in a bankruptcy or in a proposal for Revenue Canada for HST Inc. Um, and uh, payroll, the government has the right, even if your company is operating and you haven't paid your debts, HST or payroll liabilities, to pursue you as a director. It doesn't mean because you're being insolvent that they have the right. The right is there at any time. And one of the other things I should say is that what sometimes when we're doing a bankruptcy for a corporation, we actually have to bankrupt the directors also or file a proposal for them because they're unable to meet all of the personal obligations that they have actually uh, incurred such as bank loans, such as the HST, the, pay, the payroll liability, and all of those other things that we talked about above. And it's unfortunate. And that's why, again, I'll bring back, always look at that proposal because those can be compromised. Not the bank guarantees and not your guarantees generally, but at least the government debts. So another thing to look at um, in an insolvency situation, it's called a transfer for undervalue. It's a strange term. And when they came about with this current term, most of us licensed trustees, we had difficulty really understanding what they meant by undervalue. You know, what do you really mean by that? But it really means exactly what it is. You transfer something, let's just say, you know, you know that the, you're not, the company's not doing well or things aren't doing well, and you want to 
go ahead and do have some nice real property in there and you know uh, you have a, uh, a spouse or and you say you know what I think I want to transfer uh, this land over to my spouse and we'll incorporate a new company and uh, it'll be great and uh, the old company okay well it is what it is and you transfer it out that is called a transfer for undervalue and it can be attacked and we attack it all the time. We have no choice. The Bankruptcy and Insolvencies Act says that if you transfer something for undervalue within one year of you becoming insolvent, the company becoming insolvent, or you personally becoming insolvent, that is, comes right back. Trustee doesn't have to prove your intent, doesn't have to show anything except you transferred it. It's different if you're doing it to an arm's length party but it's still the same thing. You have to keep in mind when you're doing these kind of transfers, what are the consequences? And something that I always say to people when they're talking to me about it, just think of you as on the other side. You invested money in a business, you provide trade supplies to a business and all of a sudden the business has transferred its division and it's gone. How are you gonna feel? You're gonna wanna look behind and see what that transaction is all about. So it's important to deal with it. I put down some of the legislation kind of comments in as basic English as possible. It's not a straightforward section of the act, but it is there. And always remember to take a look at it. The trustee has massive powers when it's looking at a transfer for undervalue. And the other thing is, uh, oh, that's exactly what I just finished saying, Michael. Sorry. But that's okay. Uh, uh, one of the things I did want to say, and because uh, uh, Michael's very quick with the slides, because I couldn't, we couldn't could both control them, so Michael did it for me. Um, it's always good to take a good, strong look at everything you're doing, and it is important to seek professional advice. And I know that sometimes we look at it and we say, well, is it cost effective? It is cost effective. Go and speak to a lawyer. Try to figure out what is going on. Make sure that you do know what you've done and what you can do and how it's going to personally affect you when you're dealing with your corporations or yourself personally. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions on anything at this point? Don't see anything. Up to you, Michael. Okay, and sorry for jumping the gun on that slide, Angel. It's just when you said that's what you just talked about, I thought you'd covered it. but. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, outside of the Bankruptcy and Solvency Act, there are uh, not, if you don't call them transfers that undervalue, but there are transactions that can be uh, reviewed or attacked. Uh, the idea is similar. Uh, the main act that's used to do, to do this is the Fraudulent Conveyances Act. And that, in a nutshell, says that if you sell or give or transfer property to someone else with the intent to defeat, hinder, delay, or defraud creditors, um, that transaction can be challenged. And, and if, you, if the, uh, the person challenging the transaction proves that the transaction was made with the intent to defeat, hinder, delay, or defraud creditors, it is void as against those creditors, which means that if, if you uh, transfer something to your uh, sibling or your spouse, for example, to try and get it out of the business, um, the, the creditors can trace it and try and uh, challenge or, or try and collect the amounts as against your sibling or your spouse, the person to whom you transferred that property, they can, they can try and at least to the value of the property. A um, couple differences from what Angela was talking about under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act is that here you have to demonstrate that there was an intent to defeat, hinder, delay, or defraud creditors. And also, uh, the transaction doesn't have to be under value or made when the company is insolvent. Uh, there's a bunch of case law that 
discusses when the intention has been proven and it's got one of my favorite legal phrases which is there is a, a series of badges of fraud and those are factors that one of which is that the, the transaction was under value one of which is that the company was insolvent other ones are you know that the transaction was done secretly or the transaction was done to a related party um, and if you get enough of these badges of fraud uh, the court may well determine that that the intent to defraud creditors has been proven and uh, the transaction would uh, uh, your creditors could go after the, the spouse sibling neighbor whomever you trans uh, transferred the property to another way that transactions can be reviewed are the assignments and is through the Assignments and Preferences Act. And uh, this is an interesting one because you can arrange for your business to pay a legitimate creditor a legitimate amount. But if you have done it with the intention of giving a preference to a creditor, then the um, then the transaction is void as against affected creditors. Uh, it's similar to what Angela discussed in the context of people trying to put off HST payments and, and preferring payments to suppliers. But let's suppose, for example, that you had um, a lease and you needed to operate from the premises and you had a crucial supplier and then you had a bunch of less important suppliers. You still wanted to keep them happy, but you could get by without them if you had to. So you make sure you pay your landlord and you make sure you pay uh, your key supplier, but you leave the other suppliers uh, out in the lurch. If things go south and if those other suppliers are able to prove that you uh, paid your landlord and pay your key supplier meaning to give them a preference over their other your other creditors then those other creditors could chase those payments and trace them through the parties to whom you made the payments um, and the intent to give such a preference will be presumed to exist and you can rebut it but it's presumed to exist if you make an assignment for the benefit of creditors whether it's a proposal or an assignment into bankruptcy within 60 days of the transaction in question. So if you pay your rent for uh, May 1st and pay your key supplier on May 1st, and you're hoping to just, you know, hold off the other suppliers and pay them when you get some money in, but all of a sudden that money you're expecting doesn't come in and you go insolvent on May 27th, you are now going to, or you make an assignment on May 27th you're not gonna face a situation where your landlord and your uh, key supplier uh, may have to repay the money back into the estate so that it can be uh, distributed uh, more favorably. Um, as far as personal liability goes, uh, you might be saying, so what? It's just, they have to give it back to the company. Well, if it's a proposal and you're trying to keep the company operating, that's probably gonna wreak havoc with your ability to negotiate well with your uh, key supplier in the future. But more importantly, but something like a lease where you have a personal guarantee, uh, you may go into it saying, oh, I've paid my lease off. I'm going to be fine. I don't have any other personal guarantees. But then when the landlord has to repay that money into the pot and only gets their pro rata share of it or a, a proportionate share of it, uh, they're left uh, with money owing to them and they'll now turn to the personal guarantee. So if you're trying to assess whether or not you might have personal liability uh, and you think you've covered off all avenues where you've got a personal guarantee, for example, you do need to make sure that none of those uh, debts are reviewable uh, because that might affect whether or not you in the end have any personal liability. And the last two issues before we'll see if there are any questions are um, the oppression remedy that I alluded to earlier and uh, something called piercing the corporate veil, which I'll get to in a moment. 
Um, in short, the oppression remedy is a provision of the Business Corporations Act that essentially, you know, for lack of a better term, makes sure that businesses, that, that corporations uh, don't act unfairly. And, and it's often used to address situations where there may not otherwise be a, a legal remedy, but the court's convinced that the directors or shareholders have caused the corporation to act in a way that is oppressive. Um, there is a list in the section in question of the sorts of people who automatically qualify, but the term is as a complainant, but the legislation also says, or anybody else that the court believes is a proper person to bring a claim. So an employee, a, uh, a you know, a, a neighboring property owner might in the proper circumstances be able to say you've acted in a fashion that's oppressive. And what the, the complainant needs to demonstrate is that you have acted in an unfair manner that disregards the legitimate interests of, uh, in this instance, a creditor or any other sort of complaint. But since we're talking about creditors here, uh, that's why I've highlighted that term at the bottom of this slide. Um, so you might have the entire right to, to terminate a contract, but if the court finds that despite all the legal uh, uh, arguments being in favor of you, that you acted unfairly in doing so. And, and part of unfairly is that the other party has a legitimate uh, expectation that you're going to proceed in a certain way. Um, it, it's not, you know, things that are uh, considered that we would consider to be unfair aren't necessarily going to be oppressive. It does have to rise to another level but uh, it does provide a means by which the court can remedy uh, activity that it truly considers to be uh, beyond the pale as far as abusing the uh, corporate vehicle to try and uh, get around legitimate obligations. It's largely based on the facts uh, and it does let the court as the second bullet indicates, make any interim or final order it thinks fit. Now there is a bit of a limit in Ontario on when directors will be personally liable. Uh, typically it's only where the directors acted in bad faith or obtained a personal benefit from the oppressive conduct. Um, much of those situations would be caught in a lot of the other sorts of uh, uh, situations that we've discussed like transactions that undervalue uh, the director might get a personal benefit or dividends um, or if you've got a fraudulent intent but you need to be aware that there is this very powerful remedy out there uh, that that the courts can use in the appropriate circumstances to find directors personally liable for uh, corporate debts and obligations and lastly there is piercing the corporate veil and that is uh, an approach that exists outside of any statutes. And it essentially says that despite the fact that the corporation is a separate legal person, if someone is abusing it, uh, you can't, if they're using it almost as a mask, not a separate person, but just a, a mask, then the courts won't stand for that. They won't let you, for example, um, all the checks to the company get deposited directly into your personal account, not into a company account. Um, and then you just give the company enough money to pay uh, uh, the debts you want to pay. Um, you're not really treating the company as a separate person. You're treating it as one of your pockets in your jacket because you're depositing the funds to your personal account. And, and in that situation, the courts may well say, so why should we let you have the advantage of it being a single person or a separate person if you don't accept the obligations of it being a separate person, meaning that you can't pocket the money from the company as though it were your own. Um, 
piercing the corporate veil isn't done as a matter of course, but again, from the outset, if you have uh, gone to the bother and, and taken the step of incorporating a company uh, so that you've got this separate legal individual, separate legal person that can get its own debts and earn its own income, you have to treat it as a separate legal person or you may find that when the chips are down and you want to rely on that separate legal identity, uh, you can't do so because you didn't do so throughout the course of the corporation's life. So that I think brings us to an end uh, and I think we've gone a bit farther uh, time-wise than we'd hoped, but there's still a bit of time for questions if anybody has any. Um, if you do not uh, uh, right now, but something pops up, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, you can ask us for the slides by emailing us, but at the same time, you can uh, certainly email me with questions and uh, subject to the uh, legal information versus legal advice uh, rule, and, and uh, Angela may well be willing to do so as well, subject to having the different rule, uh, the, the trustee's advice and trustee's information rule, I suppose, uh, be happy to try and assist you. And uh, if you find that you actually do need professional assistance, we'd be glad to assist you in that regard as well. If I can make one comment um, at this point before we end, I really appreciate the time that everyone took to listen to what had to be said and to think about how to move forward once we get out of COVID-19 and how you're going to be, have to look at maybe possibly restructuring your corporation and how are you going to move forward from that time going forward. I don't think any of us know what our companies might look like or won't look like at the end. Um, things will be different and um, sometimes we really need to look at uh, coming up with a different plan moving forward. And both Michael and myself have ability and vehicles that we can talk to you about to try and um, restructure yourself if need be. Okay. Well, sorry, was that you? Well, Fraser, were you about to jump in? I think there's three. I, I wasn't going to, um, but uh, looks like we uh, can, can close it off. I see, uh, I see. Thanks, thanks, Dale, for your um, nice, uh, uh, nice comment about the webinar. Um, and thanks everyone else for joining. We'll, uh, we'll call it a day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Sure.